Thank you all for coming. We welcome Governor Little and his new administration and look forward to finding bipartisan solutions to our state's challenges. Our core values of ensuring the security of our families, providing quality educational opportunities to our children, and protecting our quality of life provide a guide that will help us work with the new administration to benefit all Idahoans. Our number one priority and the priority of nearly two-thirds of Idahoans is implementing Medicaid expansion. The people have spoken loud and clear. A simple, straightforward Medicaid expansion is what voters approved. It is the Idaho solution. Idahoans want to bring hundreds of millions of our federal dollars back home. They want quality health care for their family, friends, and neighbors. They want to stabilize our rural hospitals that fight for their survival every year. And they want to see the creation of jobs in our state that will pay more than our nationally low minimum wage. Governor Little likes to talk about the lightest hand of government. The Medicaid expansion voters approved is the most efficient and effective way to deliver health care to thousands of Idahoans. Adding burdensome, expensive, heavy-handed bureaucracies is not what the people voted for and will cause nothing but problems for many people. We hope Governor Little understands and fights for the system Idahoans voted for. The governor must also realize that no one elects special interests. Special interests work for themselves. Governor Little must have the strength to stand up to them and prioritize Idaho's families. Three years ago, the legislature removed a critical homeowner exemption because special interests said it was good for Idahoans. In fact, it was awful for Idaho's families. It is hurting homeowners across the state because of massively increasing property taxes. It's time for the governor to fight back to return this critical property tax exemption to everyday hardworking Idahoans. It will allow homeowners to exempt more of their property value as real estate values increase in Idaho. Every Democrat in the legislature opposed the current system which removed the adjustable exemption and property owners across the state now know why. We must fix this in equity without harming our local governments who provide critical services to our communities. In fact, those critical services include fire, police, and EMT protection. Idaho's first responders keep us safe every day, and now it's time that we give back. To many of Idaho's, though many of Idaho's bravest suffer from psychological injuries that are not covered by Idaho's workmen's compensation laws. Under existing rules, emergency workers must suffer concurrent physical injury before they can be treated for post-traumatic stress injuries. We are proud as Democrats to be working with law enforcement, fire and EMT officials, as well as many of my Republican colleagues to bring legislation that will change that. When successful, Idaho's bravest men and women will get the help they need without having to throw out their back or break a bone in the process. More police and fire committed suicide last year nationwide than were killed in the line of duty. That's why protecting the people who protect us every day must be a priority in 2019. With Governor Little comes an opportunity for a fresh start, which Idaho needs. He has the ability to correct past mistakes and ensure a better quality of life for Idahoans. The 2018 debt package passed and enforced by the majority should be the one of the governor's first priorities. Democrats voted against irresponsible legislation that increased taxes for Idahoans and gave substantial breaks to out-of-state corporations. Families across the state are now left wondering how they will pay for their taxes this year. We should expect this new administration to advocate for a more responsible fiscal policy that will give relief to Idahoans. Improving our education system is one of the governor's biggest responsibilities. Our children lose opportunities every year when it comes to finding good paying jobs, starting new businesses, and prospering in our state. As Idaho's education party, Democratic legislators will continue to prioritize investments in pre-K, public schools, higher education, and programs that lead to higher wages and a better future for our children. We know that education and jobs go hand in hand. If you are weak on education, you are weak on jobs and opportunity. In 2017, Idaho's Workforce Development Task Force issued a report to our last governor, which read in part, if Idaho does not act now, there is a real risk we could become a talent exporter and lose businesses to those states that have created a skilled workforce. 
Governor Little's words are encouraging, but it will take real action from our leaders to turn the corner. Idaho Democrats continue to lead on education and job security. We offer the governor any help he requires to get results. We must pay our public school teachers a competitive wage so we don't lose them to bordering states. That starts by funding a final year of the career ladder and finding ways to invent our veteran educators who play a vital role in Idaho's future success. Our rural schools particularly suffer, suffer from our years-long neglect of public education. Too many districts struggle to provide um, students with a quality education without the resources required to do so. Recruiting and retaining qualified education, educators in our rural districts remains, remains a problem that we must fix. We will be introducing legislation to provide student loan forgiveness to rural teachers who come to work on our schools and give our children the skills they need to thrive in our state. If we ignore our rural schools and the people who work in them, we ignore a vast and talented portion of Idaho that could help guide us toward a future of a higher higher wages, more homegrown businesses, thriving communities, and security for our families. I echo Representative Rippleding's sentiments that 2019 could be a turning point for Idaho in numerous ways. It will take hard work and cooperation among all parties to ensure these opportunities do not go by the wayside. Idaho Democrats remain steadfast <laughs> in our fight for Idaho's families, Idaho's children, and Idaho's future. Time for Melissa. Senator Stennett, you mentioned uh, public school teachers and competitive wages. How do you feel about Governor Little's proposal to raise the beginning teacher uh, wages to $4,000? Well, I was pleased to hear that. It's something we've been talking about, making sure that we're competitive with those uh, around us. Um, and he did talk about the beginning um, wages being at that, but that's why I mentioned the veteran wages. You know, it's, it's hard to explain when your teachers have been around for, for quite a long time that you keep helping improving those coming in without honoring all the good work of those that have been there for a while. So there is another component that I think we really need to be addressing. Well, they said that the makes it competitive with some of those states and not all of those states. Um, but they also have better benefit packages. So a lot of the expense, particularly in some of our rural schools, is trying to bring some of those discretionary funds back to be able to give them some of those benefits, health care, that sort of thing. It's a huge exp expenditure for schools and school districts. So we have to remember that they have to mitigate sometimes what we give them for things that we didn't, um, resources we didn't give them. Well, we're trying. I know that Representative Toon is trying to make sure that we honor those coming in to have that loan forgiveness, um, but uh, also to be talking with the governor, which um, I'm really pleased at his open door policy and, and his understanding of the depth of policy so that we can talk about that other component too. And that would be healthcare. Well, it would, right now we're talking about education, but healthcare too. Well, I mean, healthcare is one to education. <laughs> to right. education, yes. It's um, interesting how our other departments have healthcare addressed in their budgets differently than education, and that's something that should be rectified. I will point out there's one area that I think Governor Little missed an opportunity to follow in the footsteps of Governor Batt and some other governors, and that was to address human rights specific to uh, migrant workers in the state of Idaho, especially with the federal government pressing down on them, and then also to follow in the footsteps of government, Governor Batt which is to support our LGBT community. I think he missed an opportunity to say Idaho is on a different path with regard to human rights. And in not doing so, it feels to me like uh, when it comes to that which matters to many Idahoans, our friends and neighbors, we will um, are heading down a pass, path where the governor also ignores that. Are you going to be introducing legislation along those lines, whether it's at the words or? Yes. Yeah. Um, we're looking at legislation specifically to help with uh, our, our migrant workers, but for sure we'll be introducing um, the Human Rights Act Amendment. Yeah. I was pleased to hear that the governor did talk about um, 
firming up our, our uh, kindergartens, but um, didn't hear a lot about pre-K, but he did talk about making sure that our students are educated and where they should be by the time they're in third grade. So um, we still feel very strongly about a pre-K component, which he didn't mention. And it sounded like the governor was, was open to also open the early literacy level to pre-K. Yes. Is that something you will be bringing with the uh, Republican caucus discussion? Yes, and we already actually are on a bipartisan piece of legislation that will open some opportunities for local school districts to do what they need to do to enhance that reading initiative. Um, moving forward. And the governor's office is on The governor's office is, they've been very cagey so far as they're getting into place, but I believe <laughs> that they'll be with us on it because it's, a, I don't want to talk about it yet, but it's a smart piece of legislation and it's almost a no-brainer. Is, is that a bill to create that age limit that school districts can't spend state funds on any one year? Correct. Correct. <laughs> so I talked about it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy, for walking me right to the finish line. <laughs> Chuck. You talked about uh, loan forgiveness for rural uh, school teachers. Uh, how do you define the rural? Is that uh, anybody other than Boise and Meridian? <laughs> well, that, uh, so, so s <laughs> specifically, we're talking about Title I schools. And actually, with regard to the legislation, which I haven't reviewed for a while, I would refer you to Representative Toon. Who is our resident expert on that piece of legislation? In this speech today, we heard talk about health and welfare's budget. We heard talk about uh, education. We heard talk, a lot of talk about corrections. Are there, are there some other departments that need policy, need more funding that you're looking at that are outside of those big three that we heard almost entirely about today? You know, in his state of the state, he didn't really touch on our state employees. Um, but in his budget recommendation, he is recommending a 3% CEC increase for state employees. That's a huge area for us because we know that um, our employee, our state employees basically are so far behind the rest of the states around us that it's very hard to keep high quality state employees. Um, that's been demonstrated by an OPE report where they can't even keep inspectors for our senior citizen living homes. Um, they leave, they rotate out, and as a result, we're bringing in inspectors from Oklahoma. Almost all of that goes back to the fact that we don't pay our state employees what we need to be paying them. Um, so I was excited to see that he had a 3% increase in there, but 3% essentially matches the pace of inflation, which is roughly like 2.8 right now. So it's really not a visionary uh, approach to fixing up the issue we have with our state employees. And that runs all categories. We keep thinking about our teachers, but law enforcement, um, our departments, um, the attorney general's office. If we don't, if we're not competitive, we keep training so that they can go someplace else. And that that just isn't the best use of our most efficient use of our dollars. So raising it up and being more competitive will help retain them. We also didn't really hear anything about infrastructure. Mentioned it slightly, but not we, we, in we any didn't detail. Say any money no, right. That's true. But he did. Actually, he did question how we should be using the surplus eliminator. Um, and I think that that's a policy door opening to really talk about what are we doing to prepare ourselves for the future. And so my hope is that Governor Little is open and receptive to the idea of using that surplus eliminator in another way to create long-term investment prospects for uh, our transportation funding. But what that means is in the near term, it'll be less available so that in the long term, it can be permanently available. Um, but we'll see if that's what he wants to do, especially if he's looking at taking a $95 million surplus to eliminate the grocery tax. Um, while I think that um, for some people the grocery tax is burdensome, um, it is unfortunate that he's willing to kick out $95 million in revenue knowing as much as he knows about transportation infrastructure. I mean, Governor Little is the expert on transportation infrastructure, and it was surprising that he didn't mention it. We have to remember that the surplus eliminator also is the little bit of money that rural districts get for their, their roads and bridges, and we are very underfunded on that. And that's just going to get exacerbated by the pressure of people moving in. And it's not just roads and bridges. It's water, uh, antiquated water and sewer systems. It's the pressure that's going to be on our schools, the pressure we'll see on health care. And so we have to be thinking much further in advance about how we manage our revenues so that we can meet that demand because it's going to get um, there, all of that's going to be more pressured. Do you want to keep the surplus money or are you trying to find a different revenue source? I don't want 
to lose the little that we get in our rural districts for roads and bridges. So if it goes away, we have to understand what we're going to give to our local governments and counties to be able to cover that because they're struggling already. In the Most life of it ends up in these big corridors yeah. and not outside of it. In the lifespan of the surplus eliminator, it averages out to about $35 million a year. So is there a way for us to continue to use the surplus eliminator for some type of a, a, a trust for transportation? And then can we find that $35 million somewhere else and basically use the same distribution model? There's a way to do this, and I, I believe that Governor Little, at least on that front, is trying to think creatively on how to handle it. And $35 million over 44 counties is not a lot. Of no. Any other questions? We have a question. Okay. Did Betsy have one? What did you think overall of the governor's talk and the video? I did a happy dance. Because <laughs> I really, uh, much of what he said um, is something that we have been as Democrats talking about and pushing for and trying to get passed for over 10 years, um, at least since I've been here. So um, much of the, what he talked about education and um, the, the highlights of his speech were things that we have been working very hard towards. And so I look forward to working with him on those because we have a lot of background and experience in this and um, we want to be part at the table because it's something that's very important to us. Yeah, whether it's education and actually following through with the governor's original task force and getting starting teacher wages up to what was recommended way back then, outdoor recreation and acknowledging that it's a sustainable industry that will help our rural communities, he talked a little bit about um, how he wants to improve the early reading initiative. I mean, those are things that have been our bailiwick for a very long time. Um, I think he's going to have to do a little fuzzy math to effectively address everything and transportation infrastructure. But um, my hope is that uh, when it all shakes out that maybe they walk back from continuing to um, cut the revenue stream. I was pleased to hear so little in the state compared to most of the rest of the country. And it is the third largest economic driver. And so that it's even been talked about, um, because I've been talking about, of course, I come from one of those districts that have a lot of recreation as a, an economic driver. And it's something that we, we could so easily enhance to improve the economy. And then lastly, his cybersecurity plan at least addresses the fact that, you know, two of our departments have been hamstrung by um, problems with their computer systems, whether it be the DMV or Fish and Game. You know, the Secretary of State's been sending all of our voter data to an unsecure server in Arkansas. There's a lot of cybersecurity issues, and he's at least talking about it and prioritizing it moving forward. spelled it out for us in his state of the state today. I mean, he has basically said, we're going to protect public lands. And while he skipped over early childhood education directly, he did talk about full day kindergarten, which I think opens the door to what is actually best for our kids. Because there's a lot of science now that says that full day kindergarten may not be as beneficial as a school readiness program right before kindergarten. And I think what he's talking about is opening the door to better opportunities for all of our school districts. And having been on the uh, public lands task force and worked with public lands issues for most of the time I've been here, we've talked eight years ago about um, make sh making sure that we enhance the collaborations that are already happening around the state. And much of that was that good neighbor authority where all you do is you bring the, you're not trying to switch hands, you're making sure you're bringing all your resources to the table. And that means that you work with the federal and state agencies, work with the local communities, the timber industries to help clear and manage lands better. And that's something we've been talking about for quite a long time. And to hear that that is something that he'd, he'd like to um, push forward on make, um, makes perfect sense. That's where we should be headed with. Um, the better we do that, the less wildfires we have. And clearing that understory is going to take a lot of hands on deck to make that happen. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much for coming. Can't wait to see you next year.